Good evening, and thank you very much for coming. I want to welcome you to tonight's session of Visionary Conversations. I'm David Barnard. I'm the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Manitoba and the moderator for the evening. Appreciate seeing everyone here. Uh, not the greatest driving conditions and, uh, and mildly cool weather. So thanks very much for, for making the effort to be here. I want to thank the University of Manitoba Alumni Association for its support for this and all of our visionary conversations in partnership with the university. And I'd like to acknowledge, as we always do, that we're on Treaty 1 territory on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. This university, the city of Winnipeg, sit at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, Métis, Cree, Dakota, and Oji Cree nations. This is the sixth session in our Visionary Conversation series for 2012-2013, which includes five events here and one in Hong Kong. If you want to follow tonight's conversation on Twitter, use the hashtag hash UMVisionary. The intention of these conversations is to bring together some of the leading minds at the University of Manitoba and, our, and in our larger uh, community, including our alumni, for a dialogue with the broader community. This year, we're really pleased with uh, the people who've agreed to uh, participate with us. This is the University of Manitoba, the home of visionaries and trailblazers and innovators and pioneers and mavericks, defenders, explorers, so interesting people to listen to and to converse with. The theme tonight is the New West, the economic and political rise of Western Canada. There's been considerable public debate recently uh, to the notion, devoted to the notion that political and economic influence in Canada has shifted to the West. And our panel tonight will discuss this topic, challenge it, and discuss how Manitoba fits into this new reality. And as always, you as members of the audience will play a key role in shaping this important discussion. If you had uh, one of our early advertisements, our colleague, Professor Emeritus Paul Thomas, had been scheduled to participate tonight, but unfortunately Paul's not able to attend due to important family commitments and he sends his regrets. So the format will be each of our speakers will speak for around five to seven minutes uh, to comment on the theme. Some of them will use some visual images that you can see on the, on the screens behind us. And then we'll have a conversation, uh, invite questions and comments from the floor. Uh, there will be wireless microphones that a couple of, of my colleagues will have. They will come to you if you indicate that you have a, a comment or a question. Uh, someone will come to you and, uh, and I'll moderate the discussion as we go ahead. We promise to be done by 8.30, so just a few minutes before 8.30, I'll ask uh, Gary Glavin, who's Associate Vice President of Research, to provide a short summation of the key points. So let me introduce our first speaker from the panel tonight, Adele Perry, who is an Associate Professor of History and Canada Research Chair in Western Canadian Social History at the University of Manitoba, where she has been since 2000. She's the author of the prize-winning On the Edge of Empire, Gender, Race, and the Making of British Columbia, 1849-71, to published by the University of Toronto Press, and co-editor of Rethinking Canada, The Promise of Women's History. She's currently completing a monograph on the Creole Métis family and the British Empire that will be published by Cambridge University Press. Please join me in welcoming Adele Perry. I want to thank you all for joining us on this um, tropical and, and lovely evening. Um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me, and thank you also to President Barnard for the kind introduction. Now, as a historian, um, I want to say that the present-day Western Canada that most of us in this room live in and some of us study only looks literally new if we have a very static and truncated view of the past that preceded us. This is not to say that there hasn't been change, some of it fairly spectacular. Those of us who grew up in a 20th century Western Canada marked by declining populations and stumbling resource economies can find today's Canadian West something of a surprise one that prompts us to recalibrate our sense of regional meaning. But part of what makes today's West seem so new and different is our relatively static view of the past that preceded us. When we think of Western Canada's history, we tend to focus on the years between the 1880s and the 1940s and emphasize Western Canada as a largely rural society organized around monocrop agriculture and shaped most profoundly by the traumas and possibilities of European migration. Now, it's not to say that these things were not a part of the Western Canadian past, but simply that they were not the only one. 
are the only ones that people today might turn to profitably when trying to understand the variegated, conflicted, and worldly place we find ourselves in now. Now, Canadian historians usually admit, admit to having something we call the bias of the modern, or to our interests tilting forward in time. Um, for reasons I don't entirely understand, my own research interests are doing pretty much the opposite, and I'm increasingly um, interested in exploring the territories lying between the Great Lakes and the Pacific Coast during the 18th century and the first part of the 19th century. And I think I'm interested in this because it's a moment of really enormous possibility. It's clear that European states and corporations were interested in these places, in their people and their resources, but the precise form that the colonial state and economy and society would take was entirely up for debate. Newcomers to the early 19th century fur trade were often struck by its cosmopolitan character. In 1816, a visitor to the Northwest Company post of Fort William in what is now Thunder Bay wrote, he found people from England, Ireland, Scotland, France, Germany, Italy, Denmark, Sweden, Holland, Switzerland, the United States of America, the Gold Coast of Africa, the Sandwich Islands, Bengal, Canada, with various tribes of Indian and a mixed progeny of Creoles or half-breeds. The fur trade was one node in a global labor market for labor, one that drew on a maritime world that bridged Pacific and Atlantic and picked up people and goods where it might. Historian Henry Yu argues that the new Pacific Canada that has emerged so clearly in the last century it's also a return to the old Pacific Canada. In 1789, when John Mears arrived to trade with the Nechalmas people on Vancouver Island, he had 29 Chinese carpenters on board. Now, my own research has particularly con connected the itinerant colonial histories um, of the Caribbean and northern North America in the first half of the 19th century. For the last decade, which is a bit staggering, but I will come clean that it's taken that long, um, I've been working on a project that uses the family of James Douglas and Amelia Connolly to track the shifting politics of intimacy, race, and nation in the British Empire um, around some of the places that are illustrated on this map. James Douglas was born in Demerara, what is now Guyana, in 1803, likely to a free woman of color and an itinerant Scottish planter. After a few years of formal education in Scotland, he became a clerk in the fur trade. A decade later, Douglas would marry his employer's half Cree daughter, Amelia Connolly, by indigenous rights. Douglas rose up the Hudson's Bay Company ranks, concluding his career as the dominant Hudson's Bay Company official on the West Coast, and from 1851 to 64, serving as the governor of the colonies of British Columbia and Vancouver Island. He and Amelia would have 13 children, they'd raise six to adulthood, and they would weather the storms of a radically changing 19th century world. And this is an illustration of the two of them. Now, Douglas was a Caribbean son, but he was also a Métis husband, father, and son-in-law. All of these places were profoundly indigenous, and they remained so unequivocally. My new research projects examine someone particularly familiar to the University of Manitoba, and that is Cree Métis intellectual teacher and critic, Alexander Kennedy or Kunabwe Isbister. And I want to sort of explore him as a window into the particular connections between liberal humanitarianism and fur trade imperialism. Isbister was born in 1822 in Rupert's Land um, to an Orcadian father, there's Isbister, and um, a Métis mother. He was first educated in one of the forerunners to St. John's College, um, where we are currently located. And when he was 16, he entered the Hudson's Bay Company service as an apprentice postmaster, which was by then the highest position that an indigenous man might be promoted to. He left the Hudson's Bay Company in 1841 and moved to Scotland. He studied at the universities of Aberdeen and Edinburgh, and he published a string of articles in leading British scholarly journals. Isbister then moved to London, took a master's degree, became a barrister, and immersed himself in humanitarian improving projects, becoming a particular keystone of the Aborigines Protection Society. Isbister described himself as a delegate of, and I quote here, the native and half-caste Indians, and argued that the Hudson's Bay Company rule was outmoded, immoral, and perhaps most of all illegal, and profoundly exploitative of a vibrant and capable indigenous society. Isbister's activism was critical to the calling of Great Britain's Select Committee on the Hudson's Bay Company, which met and tabled a 400-page report in 1857. This is a little bit of a, some of the images of some of the work that he did. Isbister appeared twice before the committee, explaining, and I quote here, that his chief object in connecting myself with this movement at all 
is to improve the condition of the native and half-caste Indians in Red River Settlement. Now these are snippets, um, but they are snippets that remind us of the complexity and richness of the long history of the place that we now know as Western Canada. In 1869, the Hudson's Bay Company sold Rupert's land to Canada, treating it as nothing more than a real estate transaction. In the early 1870s, the Canadian government began a process of treaty signing and reserve settlement for indigenous peoples. In 1876, they passed the highly restrictive Indian Act and programs of residential schooling followed. Indigenous populations reached their historic low. If there was any doubt about the power of this new settler state, the crushing of the Métis and Cree resistance of 1885 made it clear enough. This year also saw the passage of the first Chinese Immigration Act and with it the inauguration of a white Canada immigration policy that would reach its apogee in 1923. The Western Canada produced through these policies would begin to fall apart after World War II. Chinese Canadians received voting rights in 1957. The ban on Chinese migration was lifted, though the formal racial preference of Canadian immigration policy would remain until 1967. Some of the most restrictive aspects of the Indian Act were repealed in 1951, and status Indians were given the right to vote federally in 1960. Populations changed. Between 1851 and 2001, Canada's Aboriginal population grew sevenfold, especially in the North and the West. By 2001, about 14% of both Manitoba and Saskatchewan's population was Aboriginal, and this will and has continued to climb. Winnipeg, the place from where Métis, Anishinaabe, and Cree people had been dispossessed, became the city with the greatest number of Indigenous peoples. The proportion of people of Asian origin in British Columbia reporting Chinese ancestry in 2001, about 10%, had finally returned to what it had been in 1901. Now, a few months ago, um, a group of Indigenous women in Saskatchewan started what has become known as the Idle No More movement, a social movement that, and I quote here, calls on all people to join in a revolution which honors and fulfills Indigenous sovereignty, which protects the land and the water. In shopping mall round dances and countless digital communications shared and teaches and marches held in cold Canadian streets in the United States, in the UK, and well beyond, People have called for a new reckoning of Canada, one that reflects indigenous, environmental, and feminist critiques of the state, and in particular, of resource capitalism. There is a lot that is new about this movement, but in some ways, it's a kind of advocacy that would not have surprised Isbister, who devoted his adult life to speaking about Red River in London and against the particular form of, of resource capitalism and colonialism represented by the Hudson's Bay Company. Nor would the support this movement has found seemed entirely unfamiliar amongst the multicultural forts of the early 19th century West. There is much that is new in the West that we live in, but there is much that is old too. We write history about the past, but we do so in the present, and we do it for the present. And it is up to us to find new histories to help us understand, to analyze, and change this world and the West that we live in now. Thank you very much, Adele. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Paul Vogt, who is Clerk of Executive Council and Cabinet Secretary for the Manitoba Government, a position he's held for the last eight years. He's also a University of Manitoba alumnus, one of our 97 Rhodes Scholars. He's formal head of the Civil Service, responsible for Executive Council, the Premier's Department, as well as Cabinet Operations. From 1999 to 2005, Paul served as Policy Secretary to Cabinet from 96 to 99, he was the research director for the opposition caucus. And prior to joining the government, Paul taught politics, economics, and philosophy at the universities of Manitoba and Winnipeg. He received his undergraduate degree here in 1983 and did graduate work at Oxford and Princeton. It's always a pleasure to welcome Paul back home. Paul? Thank you very much, David, and thank you for, uh, for inviting me tonight. Uh, as I was sitting there, uh, I actually was seized with some trepidation uh, looking out into the audience uh, to give away the punchline of, uh, of my talk tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about five uh, policy prescriptions that could fill out a, a New West agenda. And I cast my eyes over the crowd and realized that on each one of those, there were people in this audience who knew far more than I did. <laughs> and I thought, uh, you know, uh, 
I've had dreams like this, but uh, since I'm still wearing my pants, it actually isn't a dream. It's, uh, it's really happening. Um, I'm going to start uh, with an observation, uh, and actually Adele touched on this when she, uh, she used the term uh, new in, in relation to, uh, to, to the Pacific Coast. Uh, the fact that New West is actually not uh, a new term. It's a very old one, uh, almost 100 years old. And I stumbled over this fact uh, reading Jerry Friesen's book uh, on the West and saw a reference to uh, a conference, national conference that took place uh, back in the 90s, about 20 years ago, uh, titled Accommodating the New West. And uh, so I then performed my, my sort of Luddite version of a, of a Google search. Uh, I picked up the phone and called Jerry at home where <laughs> he was no doubt thinking, thinking deep thoughts, um, maybe dusting off a few, a few more manuscripts. Uh, <laughs> um, but. Um, uh, he answered, and I, I, I put the question to him, well, how long have people been using this, uh, this term, the New West? And uh, his answer surprised me. Uh, actually, the, the first uses of the term go back to the 1920s, when really you know, the paint on the new provinces and territories was, was barely dry. And already there was an assertion uh, that the West uh, had uh, a, a new claim uh, to, to a voice within Confederation. And so here we are. Uh, it's almost 100 years on. And uh, no doubt, countless um, academic uh, symposiums, manifestos, uh, swivel chair conversations like the one we're having tonight. Uh, and it's still possible to, to ask the question uh, as, if, as if it were new, um, what, what is the, the, uh, the Western agenda, the new West agenda uh, that can be brought uh, in the name of this region to, uh, to the rest of Canada? Now, a couple of observations um, before I offer some of my own uh, thoughts on this. Uh, first of all, the, the, idea, um, the idea of newness uh, in itself uh, and, and the fact that that has been a persistent or abiding feature uh, of, the, of the West's assertion uh, of its own identity to, to the rest of the country, uh, I think actually does capture uh, a commonality uh, which otherwise is very difficult to perceive uh, in, in Western contributions uh, to, to Canadian nation building. Um, I think if you, uh, if you actually tried to form a kind of greatest hits list of, uh, of what Western Canada has brought uh, to the rest of the, the country as part of its regional identity, uh, you would come off with um, policy prescriptions as diverse as Medicare, uh, of course the, the natural resource ownership um, uh, debates that, that altered the Constitution ultimately uh, from out of the 70s. And then, of course, um, as we're dealing with today, um, assertions of, uh, of Aboriginal rights, which <laughs> began almost uh, from the point of contact uh, and are still uh, very much alive and very much with us. Uh, in another column, uh, I think you might talk about uh, some of the social movements and the new parties that they spawned uh, from out of the West. But then you'd be facing uh, you know, almost polar opposites on the, on the ideological spectrum, the co-op movement leading to the CF, uh, CCF and, and NDP, on the one extreme, and on the other extreme, uh, social credit um, resulting ultimately in, in the Reform Party as, as a new party spawned out of, out of the West. And then finally, I think in, in the last column, you'd have to talk about uh, the iconoclastic leaders that, uh, that have uh, regularly come out of the West. Um, but again, a very anomalous group uh, that it's hard to, to really uh, you know, imagine uh, in, in any kind of uh, category uh, joined together. Um, as anomalous as Lougheed and Schreier uh, in power at the same time, uh, Douglas, uh, Roblin, um, and then going further back, Manning, uh, we think we'd have to put in McClung, uh, Riel, Pegwis. Um, there isn't uh, obviously uh, a common denominator uh, that's easy to point to. But I would say that uh, this very idea uh, and this, this constant assertion uh, that the West is identified with newness I think does point to, to some kind of a root or at least a, a family resemblance uh, that would bind together uh, a lot of these different contributions to the nation. Um, I think there is a, there is a sense uh, that we have from the frontier days, and it's still very much a conceit, I think, among Westerners that uh, as you cast your eye from, from the east to the west uh, in our country, uh, Canada in some sense uh, grows younger, sort of more experimental, maybe hardier. Um, less, less moored in the past, uh, more open to the future. And I think you know, that idea, uh, and it may be a thin uh, veneer uh, over concealing a great deal of, of difference, but I think that idea probably does sum up uh, these very different uh, contributions uh, to, to nation building in Canada from uh, 
as I said, these, uh, these social movements, uh, the party spawning, and, and, uh, and these various uh, leaders who have, who have spoken on our behalf. But uh, I don't want to exaggerate it. Um, it, is, it is rather thin. And uh, I think in, in, uh, you know, just to, to dwell on the negative for a second, um, if anything, it probably has become more difficult uh, over time to assert uh, a single coherent uh, or unified Western uh, identity, a, a, a voice uh, of, of the new West or uh, of, the, of the current West. And I think that um, uh, there's a number of factors involved in this. Uh, one is that, uh, of course, there is not uh, a, a clear uh, geopolitical or geographical uh, coherence to the West. Uh, I think once upon a time, uh, one could speak about the Prairie West, uh, a region that was bound together or based upon uh, on the wheat or grain industry. Um, but even that um, assertion did, would, would have left out uh, the West Coast, and certainly it would have left out the North, not just the far North uh, and the territories, but, uh, but even the the north of 60 regions uh, on the prairie provinces themselves. So, and, and, and I think that coherence, um, even in its limited form, uh, has given way, and I think uh, Ian will be talking about this uh, in, in, in more detail, has given away more recently uh, to economies um, that uh, still export based in all cases, but, but uh, based on very different commodities, spawning not just different economic interests, but in fact very different cultures uh, with, within each of uh, the Western provinces and territories. Um, secondly, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunately uh, a, a fact of, uh, of, of jurisdictional politics uh, within Canada, within the Confederation, that simply drawing lines on the map, uh, as capricious as that was uh, at the time that the, uh, uh, the provinces and the territories were demarcated, uh, sets in train a whole set of, of jurisdictional rivalries which divide the provinces uh, between each other just as much as they divide the provinces as a group um, from the federal government. Uh, so there is a real challenge uh, in the West as, as in other regions of Canada which are not single provinces uh, to, to articulating uh, a single set of, uh, of, of policy priorities uh, or, or giving voice uh, to those. Now, and, and I think this is illustrated, and I see I'm actually nearing the end of my time. I'm going to have to, <laughs> have to speed this up a little bit uh, before the orchestra starts. Um, uh, I think this is illustrated by, by the fate of, of the New West Partnership, uh, the partnership formed between, initially between uh, Alberta and BC, then joined by Saskatchewan. In the seven years that it's existed, uh, the outcomes have been quite meager. And in fact, at this point, I think they've been shelved, at least for the time being, by the rift uh, over the Gateway Pipeline uh, between BC and Alberta. Um, that, I think, illustrates uh, uh, you know, weakness uh, of trying to articulate a voice, um, but, but without having uh, an, um, an ambitious policy agenda and one around which uh, citizens of the West uh, can, can rally. So I'm going to suggest um, five ideas that uh, I'd be happy to, to discuss uh, uh, in, in questions uh, that I think uh, could be put forward as, uh, as articulating uh, a Western vision uh, that unites uh, the different regions and also uh, makes a contribution to, to nation building in Canada. And I'll simply let list off the titles and I think you'll get the gist of it, uh, but uh, I can return to, uh, to it in more detail. Number one, um, Skills uh, and, and a people strategy are more important than a resource strategy for the economic future uh, of the West. And I think the, the pillars of a, of a skills strategy in Western Canada uh, have to be based on the post-secondary system uh, being more integrated, uh, immigration being increased, uh, Aboriginal education outcomes being dramatically improved. Uh, secondly, um, turn northward. Uh, the new frontier uh, is in the north. Uh, of the western region of, of, of Canada. Um, there's many ways to illustrate that. Uh, the, the mining developments alone um, have indicated, and in a way that has caught international interest, uh, that one of the big challenges facing the west is actually to be uh, the gateway uh, to the north. Uh, there, are many, there are now many more avenues into the north, and certainly other nations uh, willing to, uh, to step in as, as development partners. Third, uh, it's time to make a proactive uh, presentation to, to the Aboriginal citizens of the West on uh, the issue of economic partnerships. And there are templates for doing that. They've been demonstrated in Quebec, in Manitoba, the Northwest Territories. Um, it is time to be, uh, to be the, the first uh, movers 
uh, in that partnership. And I think if we fail to do so, uh, I think uh, all of us can sense uh, what's, uh, what the consequences will be uh, over the coming decades. Uh, fourth, uh, the combination of the energy of energy in the environment uh, needs to be articulated. Uh, there have been efforts to do so. Um, I think uh, the, the fact that we have a, a premier in Alberta now uh, who has actually conceptually at least uh, advanced a framework for having that discussion uh, I think is, is, a, is a great step forward. Uh, there's also a group known as the Winnipeg Consensus Group, um, NGOs and, and uh, uh, and, and corporations uh, which have advanced uh, a set of policies prescriptions along the same line recognizing that the Canadian brand uh, for energy exports is one brand no matter what market we're selling into and what particular form, form of energy. And finally, uh, speaking about the environment, uh, the number one issue for citizens and I think on the prairies the number one issue period uh, is water management uh, and, and water quality protection. And the fact that uh, a, a drop of H2O that, that lands on the eastern slopes of the Rockies eventually makes it uh, into to Lake Winnipeg should be reason enough uh, to see this as a regional challenge and one that can only be addressed um, by concerted action uh, across borders. And finally, in, in, in the time that I, that I no longer have, <laughs> um, let me make a, a, just a very quick uh, personal statement. David said that we could be somewhat provocative. Um, my, my identity as a Western Canadian is actually a highly provisional one, uh, like the bombers. Um, uh, I consider myself a Canadian first, second, third. And uh, to my mind, uh, the only uh, policy prescriptions, and I think the list could be much longer here, but the only ones I think I would countenance uh, would be ones that would contribute to, to nation building uh, across the country. Uh, I think the firewall manifesto of, of 2001 marked an absolute low point uh, in debates over the, the identity of the West. Uh, and I, I was very happy to see, uh, particularly around the time of uh, Peter Lougheed's death, uh, a, a return to discussion of, of the Western Canadian identity squarely uh, in the context uh, of, of building a, a stronger federation within Canada. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Uh, our final uh, panelist tonight is Ian Hudson, who's Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Manitoba. He's the co-author of, uh, or an author of a number of books, To Live and Die in America, Class, Power, Health, and Healthcare, The Gatekeeper, 60 Years of Economics According to the New York Times, Social Murder and Other Shortcomings of Conservative Economics, and Fair Trade, Sustainability, and Social Change. Please join me in welcoming Ian Hudson. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for that nice introduction, and thanks to both uh, Adele and Paul um, for their excellent presentations. I might actually borrow one of Paul's slides at some point during my own, because it dovetails nicely with what I have to say. Um, after listening to Adele, I realized that my presentation is unbelievably current. Uh, my sort of 10-year time sweep here seems amazingly tiny and insignificant. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the, the first thing I thought when I was told about the topic is um, maybe we should see if there is a rise of the West instead of just taking it as a sort of statement of truth without uh, verifying it. And so what I did was just provide on the PowerPoint there one, I guess, particularly obvious uh, gauge of um, the economy, uh, how uh, average incomes are doing. And what you've got is the gray lines or the um, annual change in uh, average incomes between 2000 and 2010, the red lines between 2005 and 2010. And what you can see is the rise of the West is, to a certain extent, a, a large extent, the rise of two provinces. Um, British Columbia fares slightly better than the national average, although not over the last five years. Manitoba fares slightly better than the national average. But the real drivers of the growth of the Western Canadian economy are clearly Saskatchewan and Alberta. And if you look at the Saskatchewan number, uh, the growth is truly phenomenal, their growth in income. And so I, I did this for average uh, incomes, but I could have provided similar data 
for a wide variety of economic indicators. I could have provided something similar for unemployment, for economic growth, a whole host of things. And so if we're going to talk about the rise of the West, it might be clear, as, as I think Paul tried to do to a certain extent, to argue that the West is not a homogeneous group of product, or ho homogeneous group of provinces with a you know, common united interest. Rather, there's very different provinces with de very different stories going on. And what becomes clear here is that the rise of the West is really the, ri the dramatic rise of Saskatchewan and the continuing rise of Alberta. And as Paul showed with his PowerPoint slide that he had to move through very, very quickly, if we look at the rise of Saskatchewan and Alberta, and you ask, well, what is causing that rise? The easy and inevitable answer is energy. And so Paul had a slide about sort of energy as a percent of GDP. Here's another way of looking at that. It's exports per worker. And what you can see from these numbers is that Alberta and Saskatchewan earn far more per worker in exports than almost any other province. Certainly far higher than the Canadian average, far higher than both BC and Manitoba. And that is being driven by energy exports. A long time ago, a Canadian economic historian made something of a name for himself, or at least as much a name as you can make for yourself in economic history. A guy, a guy named Harold Innes came up with this theory called the Staples Theory. And what he argued was you could trace the history of Canada simply by looking at a stable resource commodity that particularly, particularly economies depended on crucially for almost all of their revenue. So we traced the history of Canada first through the cod, and then through timber, and then through fur. And if we look at what's going on in Western Canada uh, right now, this, this Staples theory still has a lot of explanatory power. If we look at the rise of Western Canada, trace that to the rise of Saskatchewan and Alberta, we've simply replaced cod and timber with fur and furs with oil. And that replacement has a lot of issues, a dependency on a resource export as the main driver of your economy contains some problematic issues that I'll talk about. Now, I don't want to claim that oil and cod are the same thing. Clearly, if you're going to rely on one export and be dependent on that for your income, oil's far better than cod, right? <laughs> oil has a much higher demand, the price of it's far higher, right? The demand for it's more stable. All those things are absolutely true. But at the same time, there are some important, some very important issues associated with a rise of a particular group of provinces whose economies are being driven by an export that is dependent on sort of resource export. And so what are some of these issues? So I, I thought about these things, and there's a couple of problematic uh, issues that people have brought up. And so I'm going to list these and talk a tiny bit about them, although they're in, in no particular order here. The first one is that the difference in resource revenue that's available to the different provinces makes a very large difference for those provinces' budget. And so the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan can deliver provincial services with much lower tax rates than is the case for other provinces. They earn tremendous amounts of, re of money from these resources. And as a result, a province like Alberta can deliver um, services as well as Manitoba, but at far lower tax rates. So in Alberta, for example, they spend as much per person as a government as other provinces in Canada. But they do so with far lower tax rates. And the same thing's starting to be true of Saskatchewan. And so what that does is puts tax pressure on all the other provincial jurisdictions in the country. Right? If there's a tax differential between Alberta and Manitoba, that puts pressure on the Manitoba government. People look around and say, well, why can't you offer the same sort of low taxes that the province of Alberta offers? What's wrong with the Manitoban government that it can't balance its budget in the same way? And so it creates, in some ways, an advantage. Well, not in some ways. It creates a very real advantage for the resource provinces that can pad their governmental budget with resource revenues that are not available to other provinces in Canada. So that's the first issue. 
The second issue has been termed Dutch disease, uh, which started off, obviously, as a problem in Holland. The idea behind the Dutch disease is that oil exports force up the value of a country's currency, and that the high value of that country's currency put downward or make it less likely that nations are going to be able to export easily, and they're more likely to import more. And so the idea behind the Dutch disease is that nations that export a lot of, in this case, oil, but it could be any resource, find that it has negative impacts on the rest of their economic sector. This, was, this specter of the Dutch disease was raised by, uh, by Thomas Mulcair, uh, the, the federal NDP leader. And he was sort of roundly criticized for this, especially in Western Canada. And in some ways, this criticism was justified. It was justified because the problems of the Canadian manufacturing sector are not strictly linked to a high Canadian dollar caused by oil exports from Alberta and Saskatchewan. Canadian manufacturing suffers from a whole host of problems. However, it is also true that the Canadian manufacturing sector would benefit from a lower dollar, and it is also true that our oil exports keep our dollar higher than it otherwise would be. And so the, Dutch, the specter of the Dutch disease is not absent, right? There are sort of knock-on effects of these resource exports. And then the third issue uh, that I think I would be remiss if I didn't talk about, and Paul mentioned very briefly, is that if you've got an economic engine that is driving two of the sort of fastest growing provinces in the nation and driving it very strongly, often the environmental implications of this resource development are overlooked. And we're relying on energy exports from the tar sands, which have a host of very, very problematic environmental consequences. And so far, at least in terms of policy, we've been very willing to sweep those environmental problems under the rug. Right? We have, in many ways, sacrificed the envir negative environmental consequences of the production of this energy for the jobs and income they provide in these two fast-growing Western provinces. And so if we're going to talk a little bit about the rise of the West, I guess the big concluding comment might be the rise of the West is, by and large, the rise of two provinces. The rise of those two provinces has been driven by energy exports that looks a lot like the Staples theory outlined by Harold Innes, and that many of the costs in terms of the uh, tax impact for, uh, in tax competition for provinces, in terms of the Dutch disease, and in terms of our environmental record, have largely been ignored or at the very least underplayed. Well, their contribution to the growth in these two provinces has been very much to the forefront. I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. So now we'll uh, have our conversation. If you have uh, a question or a comment, uh, please raise your hand and one of my colleagues will come to you. Just uh, while you're working up the uh, nerves to do that, let me ask a question, uh, Paul, of you initially. You talked about uh, the importance of uh, people, talent, education, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, the, the precedence that that might take over, uh, over resources, and yet uh, Ian's uh, uh, Ian's economic analysis suggests that, the, as he concluded, the Staples theory still seems to be uh, a pretty strong uh, explanation of a number of the things that are currently happening. So is, is yours a more aspirational view, or how were you, how were you <laughs> seeing that? Uh, I don't think we're totally in disagreement, although one of the slides I had up there also tried to indicate that, um, as, as, as in all economies across Canada, actually, the growth of the service sector has actually has started to, to dwarf uh, that of the, uh, the natural resource-based sector. In fact, uh, what you saw was a comparison of the service sector to the combined manufacturing and, and natural resource sector. And, and it is across the country, it's, it's, uh, or, or across the West, uh, it, is now, it is now a larger factor. Um, but actually, uh, I don't think that we're in, in disagreement. Uh, we, uh, I think that um, looking at even the resource sector, um, the, uh, 
the challenge uh, is, to, is to actually provide uh, the people, uh, the, the workforce, uh, uh, that, can, that can manage both the, the environmental challenges, if, if, uh, if those are addressed more forcefully, and, and the extraction uh, uh, challenges uh, in, in resource sectors. So I think, um, but I think what, what probably both of us would, would stress is that uh, uh, it's been the challenge for the West uh, for you know, 50, 60 years now uh, to take uh, what, what ought to be a springboard, uh, which is this bounty uh, of natural resources, uh, you know, most of which under our feet, uh, or in the case of Manitoba, more flowing past us, uh, and, and use it to diversify the economy, to, mm -hmm. to, to add value, uh, to, to boost uh, other sectors of the economy which, which will be uh, sustainable over the long run. And I think uh, from that perspective, uh, sometimes the resource economy is, is not your springboard, it becomes a rut uh, that is very difficult to get out of, even though um, one of us has say that, that many people would like to, to be in that rut <laughs> who, don't, who don't share <laughs> the same resources. Um, but I think uh, you know, the emphasis on, I, I think that the biggest challenge to, uh, to Western growth uh, over the next uh, next several decades and as far as we can see forward uh, is, is people, uh, is the development of the people resource, not, uh, not natural resources per se. Thank you. Folks, comments, questions? Here. I just wondered if uh, uh, I could have a comment on what uh, the, the group might think if uh, the uh, a production of our oil and the cutting of our forests and our trees were slowed down to uh, meet uh, the environmental concerns to keep pace with those and uh, the effect that that might have on the long-term health of the economy. I'm not talking about short-term. I gather we, we would probably pay in the short-term, but what effect would that have in the long-term if, if we had a managed uh, production rate of our uh, um, resource economy in terms of the general health of the country and the growth in Western Canada. Jean, you want to start on that? Sure. Um, I think, uh, I mean, everyone knows that oil is a finite resource, right? There's only some of it, so much of it in the ground. You, you pump it out, it's gone. Um, the difficulty that the oil producing provinces face is that if they go with a more managed, managed approach and slow down the amount uh, that they're producing of oil, then what they risk is leaving oil in the ground if alternative technologies are developed. And so in some ways their calculation, I think, is very much with the price of oil as it is, and the demand for oil as it is, uh, we're far better off to pump like crazy now uh, than conserve the resource in the hope that there's still going to be as high a price and as strong a demand in the future. And so I can certainly understand their incentive uh, to try and get as much out of the ground as they possibly can in the very short term. One, part of the problem in answering this question is that there, there, there is so little uh, unbiased commentary on, on, what, on, on, the, on the various on, on, you know, variables at play. And I think um, uh, you know, it's, it's been a challenge uh, for, for average citizens, but it's also been a challenge for economists to actually uh, piece together uh, what would be the, the advantages of more managed development uh, as opposed to, to what we're seeing right now, which is a, which is a very rapid pace. Uh, I'd only note that, um, that Peter Lougheed, who uh, is hardly a, you know, a raving either environmentalist or, uh, um, uh, or, or in any way uh, you know, opposed to, to the to development of resources, was one of the people in Alberta calling for uh, a more orderly uh, approach. And uh, the other factor, besides you know, the, the dynamic that, that Ian mentioned, is of course that uh, you know, if you look at Fort McMurray and, uh, and, and the, the pressure uh, on, on infrastructure, uh, the challenges to, to sustaining livable communities uh, in and around the real epicenter uh, of, of the extraction areas. Uh, there are real social costs as well to, to that rapid a pace of, of development. So it's, it's another piece to be entered into the, to the entire uh, economic equation. But as I said, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to actually get 
um, you know, an analysis of those factors uh, that isn't pitched on, on one side or the other. And I think, um, I think as I said, uh, citizens as well as experts are, 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 are struggling with that. Question over here. Adam, hello, my name is Vec Coral, uh, the Renaissance man. Uh, uh, Dr. Bernard, you uh, f forgot to tell us tonight that, that uh, the topic tonight was supposed to have been uh, global warming, but it's actually cooling, so you couldn't get speakers. Uh, so far for the intro. Uh, the uh, particular question to, to Ian Hudson, uh, can you m make a comment regarding the, p the, politic the political ideologies in the Western provinces, particularly if you want to compare Alberta and Saskatchewan with reference, uh, comparing the eras uh, going back to Lougheed and Trudeau and, and Divine and Ro uh, Romano, and, and now we've got Wall coming in, perhaps taking credit. <laughs> Could you make a comment on that, please? We're moving well out of my area of expertise for that. Uh, <laughs> DePaul or Adele, want to take that? No, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <Well. laughs> Fair enough. Uh, well, actually, uh, this is actually almost going back to my academic uh, career. Uh, there, there's a lot. There's a lot that feeds into an ideological tradition, and uh, uh, I think uh, Adele probably probably does have a lot to say on this topic. Uh, there's there's a lot of historical roots to the differences between, say, the political tradition and and where its center of gravity lies in Manitoba uh, versus Alberta. Um, and, and it has to do with immigration patterns uh, as well as with, um, obviously, with, with uh, the, the type of economy uh, that's, that's been developed in, in both, uh, in, 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 in say, the two, the two respective jurisdictions. Um, uh, I, I think that, you know, beyond the stereotypes, uh, there's, there's also uh, quite a bit of change taking place. And, and although I didn't get to this, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, you've, even, even within Calgary, uh, if you see recent, uh, you know, elect civic, civic politics and the mayor and council that has been elected, our image of, uh, of Alberta as, uh, as the bastion uh, of a sort of reform uh, outlook, you know, sort of would be associated with the Manning senior and junior, uh, I think is, is actually very rapidly changing. Uh, in Manitoba, less so, but, uh, but if our image uh, of Manitoba uh, has been of uh, sort of a, a, a more, you know, sort of a, a, either the CCF or, 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 or a moderate uh, a form of, uh, of conservatism. I think, I think even that within the last uh, decade or so uh, has, 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 has been changed quite dramatically. So, so I think that uh, these, are, these are living things and, uh, and actually under the pressure even of, of very recent uh, developments, uh, I think there's, there's been quite a, quite a change from what the conventional image uh, of, of those, those provinces has been in their, their ideological traditions. I think too we often also um, have kind of an idea of what a Western kind of political perspective is, but when historians and political scientists kind of try and get down to the nitty gritty and parse what that exactly looked like, it becomes pretty hard to do so and we come down to an idea of the West as Jerry Friesen uh, once wrote as four provinces. Um, or as Ramsey Cook once wrote, we ended up with a whittling it down, just basically being back to, to the regional identity really being a province. There's four kind of distinct political traditions. And none of them have also been without conflict or change. And, and the ones that are happening in Alberta right now are, are striking. Um, but those changes have occurred in all sorts of ways over the 20th century. Thank you. Here. Uh, the topic is new. West, the economic and political rise of Western Canada. And I want to ask all, the whole, all of the panelists to comment. Canada is making efforts to make deals with a whole bunch of Asian countries, uh, the, the one being Trans-Pacific Partnership that's being talked about, so which essentially means we are going to have different deals to free up trade and investment relationships. Uh, between Canada and a whole bunch of Asian countries. Wouldn't this give greater importance to Western Canada uh, than all we have heard so far? Sure. I mean, I would, 
I guess, two things. One is, is that Canada's place in a trans-Pacific world isn't wholly new, and it's sometimes um, represented as something that's only kind of recently arrived. Um, but the Hudson's Bay Company had a fort in Hawaii, and they traded sea otter pelts through the Canton market. Um, Canada has always been a Pacific Canada. And in most parts of Western Canada, Asian migration occurred at exactly the same time as any other non-Indigenous migration. Um, certainly, there is different sorts of global capitalism that have developed in the last couple of decades than was previously, but I don't know if we can parse that particularly on a geographic basis. The real challenge remains what is going to be the relationship of these places we live in to globalized capitalism, whatever national form it takes. Yeah, I, th I agree that I, th I think this isn't entirely new, but I think what, what is emerging uh, is, is something that we hadn't seen before, which of course is investment uh, in, in, uh, in Western Canada from uh, from Asian countries, and, and particularly, of course, the issue of, of uh, sovereign investment funds. And federal government uh, recently made a decision, which I thought was actually one of the most significant uh, for you know for the, the trends that we'll see in the future. Although they ended up coming right down the middle on it, uh, approving the next uh, 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 purchase, but uh, but also throwing up cautions that uh, that in the future. Uh, you know, key sectors would not be uh, would not be as open to uh, uh, to investment. But one thing uh, I, I was, if, if, uh, if I'd had more time, uh, I wanted to draw attention to is that in talking about um, about the need to turn and face the north, and Art Morrow gave a, a fantastic talk on this about a year and a half ago or two years ago. Um, uh, there is a great deal of interest in the north uh, that's not coming from Canada. Um, and the Chinese have, in fact, acquired a fleet of, of icebreakers. They are looking at the opportunity of shipping through the Northwest Passage, linking it uh, to what's obviously a very concerted strategy uh, to secure their supply chains. And I think that's going to have tremendous significance. Uh, and, 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 and perhaps even there's a little bit of a threat in there that, uh, that if Western Canada, that is those of us who are all you know, squeezed into the, that little corridor in the uh, 150 miles uh, from, from the border, don't turn and face the north. Uh, there's a very good chance that, in fact, its development won't be uh, linked um, back through uh, through the near north and uh, and the southern port, uh, parts of the west. Yeah, uh, the Canadian government is signing uh, free trade agreements with, with anyone that'll throw a paper in front of them. Uh, and so it's, it's not just Asian countries, it's Europe, signing one with Europe and, and everyone. Um, but having said that, there's no question that the pattern of, uh, of trade in Canada is changing. And so the United States is still far and away our dominant trading partner. But clearly the big mover in international trade is China. And despite the fact that we're signing free trade agree agreements with everybody, there's absolutely no question that the booming trade is with, ch with China right now. And I believe we're going to talk about that at a future visionary conversation series that people might be interested in. Um, but, but I think the question with these kind of agreements, uh, like, like Adele is suggesting, is is less um, where it's coming from and who your partners are, but what are going to be the terms of these agreements and on what conditions is the international trade going to occur under? And I think those are the real issues, uh, more than which trading partner is gaining and which trade partner is on the decline and things like that. Okay. Up here. Adele, you, uh, you used a, a, a map of the world to talk about um, to place the Hudson's <coughs> Bay Company and to place uh, Douglas uh, in relation to the New West. And mm -hmm. Paul, you, uh, you talked about the North as a new frontier. And uh, what I'm wondering is how much of the image of, of the New West, uh, historically or otherwise, is contingent on the view from elsewhere 
Well, I mean, I think it's almost probably 100% contingent on the view from elsewhere um, in the sense that, that this is obviously not new territory for Indigenous peoples, and they have made that point, um, you know, forcibly since, since contact. Um, but I will also, I guess, caution us against a kind of an overly localized view that dichotomizes um, elsewhere and, and the local as places that have no relationship to one another. Um, this new West, this old West, whatever West we're in, exists in conversation with, with the Canada that, that Paul talked about. It exists in conversation with, with the global world. It has existed in conversation with empires, and in lots of ways it still does. Um, so I think it does, but it does so in ways that are perhaps a little more complicated than um, analyses about Western Canada that kind of focus on it entirely as a local um, experience, kind of hived off from the rest of the world. Uh, because, you know, we know from our life now that, our, that however local they are, we're profoundly affected uh, by what goes around us in a wider world, and that's true for the past as well. And I think one of the, certainly one of the really exciting developments in sort of historical scholarship is, is work that, that doesn't presume the history is best told through the rubric of the nation state or of the local or of the regional, but instead sees it in these wider ways and wider kind of connected ways that, that, that put these places in conversation with one another. Well, I, I agree that the answer to your, to your question, of course, is yes. Uh, uh, the, but I, but I think that that we've all tried to suggest in different ways that uh, that there needs to be somewhat of a broadening out of our awareness of that, our own uh, perspective. And uh, in, in talking about uh, the the view of the North, um, uh, it's trying to draw attention to the, to the fact. And actually, there's there's a wonderful image uh, that, uh, that Margaret Atwood uses when she talks about the Canadian identity uh, being informed by the North, but in the sense that, uh, that, that uh, we feel it as kind of a chill at the nape of the neck. And of course, what that implies is that, uh, is that we're, we're facing southward, uh, which I think is, a, you know, is, is, is actually part of an, an important implication and, and, and actually important uh, insight into, into what much of uh, you know, Canadian development up to this point has been, the Aboriginal people accepted. But uh, demographically, Canada, and, and especially the West, uh, has the shape of Chile. It's actually, it's just a narrow band of, of concentrated population along the, uh, the border. So, you know, to, to get back to Atwood's image, it's almost like we've been standing with our toes <laughs> on the border, um, you know, facing intently uh, towards our, our customers and the, the, the culture that's, uh, that's been the most uh, influential for us over the last hundred years. And I think, um, you know, the idea uh, of of broadening that perspective and also be becoming more aware of of, uh, of our of that place, you know, that uh, as shown on some of those maps, uh, I think is is a very important part of what what the new West should be about uh, in, as it goes forward. Okay. Up here. Thank you, Ian. I'm supposed to take issue um, as the honorary consul for the Netherlands um, on this Dutch disease <laughs> issue. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's only because as the, um, the, the second largest investor in Canada and, and the, the second largest uh, exporter of food in the world, you know, getting a little of that Dutch sickness wouldn't be a bad thing for Canada. <laughs> but my question is this, for any of the panelists, I see, I think it was Adele's slide that there's seven provinces or territories. Um, is there any chance that we'll ever speak with one voice in the West? No. <laughs> 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 um, there's lots of ways that, that that will be fractured. It'll be fractured by um, the distinctions of, of the four provinces and the two or three territories, depending how we splice them. But it will also be uh, fractured by social division um, within these places, by, by gender, by, by, by race and ethnicity, by nation, by competing visions of, of the world that we live in. I would have to agree. I, I, I outlined five ways in which I think we should be acting in concert and speaking with one voice, but uh, I actually don't have a high expectation that on any of those topics uh, that, that there will be a, a co coalescing of, of, a, of a Western view or a Western voice. And I think part of it is, as, as I said, that uh, uh, once you draw those lines on a map, and, uh, and you, can, you can even tell from you know, the, the straightness of the lines on the prairies just how, I mean, it, it really did seem like someone had just taken a ruler uh, to, uh, 
to a, a you know, single continuous territory. But once you do, uh, then everybody dons their, uh, uh, their jerseys, as it were, uh, to use a, a Canadian metaphor, and, uh, and you're set against each other. And it's, it's not just the media, but it's actual, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly political leaders uh, in Manitoba as, as well as in any other place. Uh, that love invidious comparisons that uh, that indicate that uh, you know there's a Manitoba advantage or an Alberta advantage, um, and 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 you know besides which you get uh, what we saw with the New West Partnership, uh, you get one one province's uh, you know key project uh, you know being being uh, uh, posed by by the other, and all uh, discussion about collaborative uh, work uh, you know comes to to a halt. And uh, so I, I, I you know, despair a little bit, but, I, but it simply is in the nature, uh, because of the, the very broad jurisdictions that are given to provinces and, and given to them exclusively, uh, it's in the nature of the way we have carved up uh, the country that uh, it's virtually impossible to get the kind of concerted action that would, that would give us one voice. Um, my question is, is for, for Ian. I, 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 you know, Ian, I'm familiar with some of your past work, and you made reference to the tax pressures that get put on adjacent provinces when, um, when you get a spike in economic growth uh, in another province. And I, I believe I'm right in saying that some of your previous work has suggested that in comparing taxation rates between Manitoba and uh, Alberta, I think was the, was the work, uh, that Manitoba didn't come out too badly, despite the difficulties of, you know, you're comparing apples and oranges sometimes, uh, having tried to level it out. Manitoba didn't come out too badly. Um, my question is that if I am right in my memory, um, that strikes me that the tax pressures that are there now to lower taxes are as much ideological as they are economic. Uh, that the Frontier Institute, the Taxpayers Federation are going to start, you know, they're into taxes are bad and let's have some small government and the devil take the hindmost ideology. It, it is, can you comment on, on whether this is as much an ideological issue as it is an economic issue? And if I've got it right, that Manitoba's not too badly in this regard? Right. So there's two issues about that. It, it certainly is an ideological issue in the sense that those who benefit from lower taxes are lobbying very hard for those, tax, for those lowering of taxes. Um, but the analysis, the tax comparison between Alberta and Manitoba depends a little bit, uh, as Adele might say, on which kind of Manitoban or Albertan you are. So for people at the lower end of the income spectrum, the, tax, the taxes are very similar between the provinces. But the farther you move up the income spectrum, the more different they become. And so for people at very high ends of the income spectrum or for people that earn more of their income from business, Alberta, they do pay lower taxes in Alberta. And so that, that tax pressure, the tax difference does legitimately exist. Whether that re results in a whole bunch of people up and moving sticks from Manitoba to Alberta just because they're going to save $3,000 on the yearly tax bill is rather slightly more difficult to say. Um, but there is an actual gap, especially at high income levels, between the provinces. Now, that gap has been pointed out repeatedly, and some might even say exploited, uh, by the groups that would benefit from lower taxes here in Manitoba. Over here. Hi, Mr. Vote. I'm very pleased to see that you're raising the issue of uh, northern uh, development. As you know, I've been working for many years trying to bring about a serious discussion of cargo airships as a solution for northern transportation problems, and as clerk, you are able to influence uh, policies that go forward or don't go forward in the province of Manitoba, so I don't understand how in good conscience you can be discussing the development of the North when, as principal advisor, you haven't been supporting uh, the movement forward with this topic. And perhaps you can tell us where you stand on this, and, and beyond that, how can we have economic development in the North when we don't have an affordable means of transportation to get there? <laughs> Was that meant for the entire panel? I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do believe there was a Mr. Boat in yes, there somewhere. I, right? I, I, I do believe. No, actually, Maybe yes, that was I, for me. I, don't know. Uh, I am very familiar with uh, with your proposals, and uh, and actually, uh, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair to myself, I suppose, um, uh, we have 
we have done some funding uh, to try and prove out the concept of, uh, of airship uh, transport to, uh, to northern Manitoba. And I don't, I don't think by any means that the government has, uh, has closed its mind on that. Uh, I think, that as, as you know, there are, some, there are some interesting challenges, and not just, uh, this isn't a local issue. Uh, uh, airship transportation uh, has not been re-embraced, uh, as it were, um, uh, uh, in other parts of the world either. Um, but I think that, you know, to broaden this out a bit, um, uh, I think that the, the issue of the ties between uh, southern communities and, and then beyond that between what I'd call the near north and the far north, I think are absolutely fundamental issues for, for the economic uh, future of the West. And, and we don't yet, I, I think that we, we, we have the advantage and you know, to give credit where it's due, uh, we have a prime minister who actually has taken uh, a very strong interest uh, in, in northern development and we have a, a, a strategy paper which at least has the outlines uh, of, a, of a national approach uh, to, to development of the north and that's you know, partly driven by sovereignty uh, concerns uh, but um, I think that, uh, that, that over the next uh, 20 to 30 years uh, if we don't uh, put a focus on developing the infrastructure and the transport links of whatever, you know, whatever method proves out to be, to be the most uh, efficient, uh, I think we're, we're, we're going to suffer for it. And, and that the, the, the suffering will take the form of seeing other countries uh, or other parts of, uh, of Canada, perhaps, out of Montreal and so on, uh, effectively uh, becoming you know, the major investors and beneficiaries of, of development uh, directly to the north of us. So I'm at least in partial agreement with, <laughs> with uh, the yeah. question. Thank you very much, all of you, for a very interesting and engaging late night for me panel. Um, I'm thinking, Ian, about what you said about how um, when things, for example, the tar sands, um, are considered to be you know, so important economically that environmental considerations get sort of swept under the rug. And so then this caused me to think that there seem to be two kind of competing narratives going on at the same time. So uh, the first being that one exactly, that um, if something is good for provinces or good for Canada economically, then somehow we uh, collectively depend on those and shouldn't be critical of them. And then that sort of narrative seems to support the narrative that those who stand out or speak out against the tar sands aren't very clever or they're young or, you know, kind of stupid. Um, and then on the other hand, there's a narrative uh, that I think people increasingly recognize that our bodies and our very well-being in that way are shaped by the environments in which we live. And so things like the tar sands, um, while they may be in some ways economically beneficial, are perhaps in other ways very importantly not beneficial, particularly for the usually indigenous communities who live closest to those kind of environmental uh, things. <laughs> so I guess I'm wondering to what extent is that first narrative true and then therefore how critical can we or whether, whether the truth or not truth of that first narrative is related to the environmental criticism or lack thereof of the tar sands and projects like it. Uh, I, th I think those two questions are, are quite intertwined in many ways. Um, and I think part of the reason that they're intertwined is because the first narrative that you've described uh, has been a narrative that has been uh, fairly strongly pushed um, by, among other groups, our, our federal government, who have spent uh, the sort of stim some of their stimulus money has gone to commercials supporting the benefits of the tar sands. Right? And so you've got a federal government that's actually paying lobbyists, you know, a lobby group, money to lobby on its behalf, which is, which is outrageous. And as a result, uh, the kind of information that would lead us to make a more considered uh, calculation of the costs and benefits of developing the tar sands don't really exist. Right? These things become far too inflamed in rhetorical debate where you know, environmental groups start to pose some questions about the tar sands and using our insider-outsider scenario, the conservative government starts to say, well, the funders of these environmental groups are foreign. 
and they're intruding on the Canadian political process. Um, and so these environmental groups, which are raising questions, you know, they're, they're not legitimate in many ways. Uh, and yet it's, it's some of those groups that are sort of funding some of the studies that would reveal some of the costs, the environmental costs, right? And this has more information. Uh, and so the reason these things become intertwined is because it's very, very difficult. Given the context of a political situation that argues that, or, or seems to preponderantly argue that speaking out against this is a problem and done by young people or foreigners or whoever, uh, then a cold hard benefit of the costs and benefits becomes very, very unlikely. quickly jump in. Is there also a way in which the way that we reckon the costs and benefits into itself is loaded to answering the question in one way? And I guess I'm thinking of kind of a, a generation of sort of feminist scholarship that in particular argued for kind of alternative accounting so of economic um, activities. So in other words, what becomes kind of coded as a necessary good, development, iterated in various ways. That there's we, th can we develop ways of kind of thinking about those things that acknowledge the sorts of social impacts that you know Paul alluded to and the kinds of environmental impacts that, that are so um, painfully obvious and actually think about ways about putting those in the center of social discourse around these questions as opposed to at their edge. Sure, and I would say that um, what you're talking about is, is absolutely necessary. Um, but we haven't even got to a, a stage where can, we can legitimately debate even the more narrow economic environmental cost. Something as obvious as what is the value of the water that's being used up in the production process in the, in the tar sands, right? How is the pollution impacting different actual sort of economic um, activities that different groups uh, do? And so even if you make that admittedly unbelievably narrow cost-benefit calculation. We're not even in a position to do that. And so broadening that out to then talk about how this impacts different groups in ways that are much more difficult to measure becomes, you know, so far down, you know, the, the possibility road that uh, it seems almost um, unbelievably unlikely to occur. Although it absolutely should. And the reason it's perhaps not occurring is because of the people that benefit and who gets the benefits from these, this kind of production and who bears the cost of the production. Okay. Adele, you talked about the fur trade and, and the Hudson's Bay Company and, and then Paul, you talked about um, one of your slides had a lot of mines, mineral development, and then Ian, you spoke of natural resources and you wrapped it all up nice and neatly with uh, and it's a staple theory. So I have a question for all three of you. Do you ever see a time where we have a new, new West that breaks sort of with the past of staples and resources and has a new economy? And when would that happen? And how would that happen? Seems like a question for an economist to start. <laughs> I'll start. Uh, and I mean, in some ways, uh, in answer to that, I'll, I'll apologize for defining my sort of West in terms of a Saskatchewan and Alberta bias, right? I mean, those are, are the big growers, and so if we're talking about the rise of the West, it's centered in those provinces. But, but in some ways, a province like Manitoba is, is more interesting because it's more difficult to explain. And in fact, our economy has been f performing reasonably well, right? The, the 2000s have been very, very good for Manitoba. Between 1976 and 1998, the average income of Manitobans did not change at all. In the 2000s, it has grown considerably. And we've done that while maintaining a very, very respectable, uh, far lower than all the other provinces in Western Canada, level of equality. So the inequality in this province is far lower than it is in other provinces. Um, the number of people living below the poverty line has decreased in Manitoba fairly dramatically during that period. And so the Manitoba economy, without the benefit of these highly lucrative natural resources, seems to be doing quite well. I think it was in 2009 that the median income of Manitobans went above the Canadian average for the first time in generations and generations. And so if you're going to talk about an economy that isn't quite as dependent on these kind of sort of resource activities, Manitoba might be it. Um, and so 
if you want to talk about you know how uh, the future of a new new maybe even new again uh, Western Canada might look like you you might start looking here Paul you want to comment on that I like I like this theme uh, <laughs> 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 maybe maybe I will just just continue it uh, I, I, I think Ian is right uh, actually I, uh, and and it's and it's you know it's one of those, we, we wouldn't say no in Manitoba to, to having our own oil patch. Uh, we wouldn't say no to uh, significant potash developments we have, or, or deposits. We have, we have a little bit, but, uh, but not, uh, not as much as our neighbors. And we wouldn't say no to having you know, big, thick trees like they have on the Pacific Coast as opposed to the, uh, the spindly little ones that, uh, that we tend to have uh, throughout the province. But, but having said that, um, I think we are uh, the province now which is, which is the most reflective of actually the Canadian norm in its, in its mix. And, and I think we are, uh, you know, granted that, uh, that obviously all of those who have uh, more significant uh, finite resources want to ride that uh, for, for as long as they possibly can. Uh, I think that mix is actually where the other provinces want to get to and where uh, eventually, in fact, throughout the history of the West, uh, you know, much of the, uh, you know, much of the forecasting, much of the planning has tried to move to use that, that resource uh, advantage as a springboard, uh, but a springboard into something which is more sustainable, more uh, over the long term. And, and in answer to, the, to where you started, um, yeah, obviously it, it, it will come to an end. Uh, the, uh, the, the New West, if, if we see it as, as inextricably bound up with resource extraction and, and those are finite, uh, at, at different points, uh, those, those resources will no longer be there. And at some point, that transition has to be made. And I think it's, it's you know, quite a few people have observed, uh, 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 you know, the, the, different, the different approaches of, of uh, resource extraction dependent economies around the world. And Norway, you know, has, has, has pioneered one approach, uh, which I think is, is the envy of, of many others, has actually realized this is finite. And, uh, and the future economy is something that we have to save for off of uh, the current resource boom. I mean, I was thinking a little bit about Scandinavia, which often comes up in these discussions. But I think the other thing is, is that even kind of a cursory glance at Western Canadian history um, suggests, um, you know, how kind of profoundly difficult resource dependence has often been. And, you know, I didn't have to talk about boom and bust economies because Ian was here to do it. Um, but right now, you know, we might be in a bit of a boom, but, but those have inevitably ended and sometimes really, really spectacularly. And I think it's incumbent on all of us, um, you know, to think about possibilities that, that might perhaps lead us to somewhere um, that does not kind of swing so much between these poles of optimism and despair. One more question. I just wanted to, uh, to comment. First, I'm very pleased to hear the, uh, the discussion this evening, Paul, in particular your articulation of the, the five key issues uh, that we're looking at, and specifically some of the references to the North. Uh, this won't surprise you a little bit, but uh, the, uh, the fact is, is that this country is a bit of a, a product of its history in many ways. One of that, uh, the, the creation of the West, is really the great ties that bind, and that's our transportation and distribution linkages. Um, that's what built the West, as we know it. Uh, technology is such today that actually, frankly, nobody has to go through anywhere anymore. We can bypass anybody. Um, so I, I guess I, I'll put a, a twist then uh, to that. With those historical linkages in, essences, in essence being broke, broken by, uh, by technology change, if Dr. Bernard were suddenly the president of the University of Calgary, and he invited the local people to uh, have this same discussion in Calgary. How different would this discussion be sitting in Calgary today versus, uh, well, in fact, would Manitoba even be part of that conversation? I'd be wearing boots. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. A 10-gallon hat. Yeah. <laughs> would be there. Picture it. <laughs> Uh, I think it would be quite different, uh, yeah. and I and I and I I I probably you know just to go to your last point first. Um, I think uh, at least uh, you know a, a large portion of the people discussing it would not see Manitoba as part of the equation because I think there's a current view uh, of the West in which uh, you know Manitoba remains uh, <laughs> uh, somewhat on the margins for for a number of reasons that that uh, uh, that 
won't go into detail, but I, I, I do think that, um, uh, uh, that there is a view that, that, that Calgary and, and actually Edmonton's view would be, would be different from Calgary's, by the way, but, uh, but I think Calgary certainly has a certain perspective uh, at, uh, at this point uh, that, would be, that would be different and the conversation would be different. But to get to, the, to, to your first point, uh, the transportation links uh, and, you know, not, not to beat a dead horse or beat, or, or, or beat the horse repeatedly, um, the, uh, you know, the, the fact that, uh, that we, we still do not have, um, we do have a, a, a substantial uh, development of, and, and a modern development of, of transportation links uh, in one very narrow corridor uh, of the west. Uh, we don't have the same links uh, uh, extending up uh, into the north, even into, into the near north. And that, I think, is a, is, is a, is a challenge that's shared uh, with Alberta, with Manitoba, with, uh, with BC. And, uh, and it actually, and it is a, it is a hamper on, uh, on future development prospects. Uh, my, uh, we weren't able to, to find a slide that really illustrated this, but alongside the developments, we were going to try and indicate the road networks, and you could probably superimpose over that as well, flight access. Uh, once upon a time, my, my former boss uh, went out to Toronto and gave a speech in which he actually projected the, the transmission grid uh, for, for electricity uh, onto the uh, over superimposed over Canada and showed that every single major line was running north-south. We have virtually no uh, capacity uh, to, to wheel uh, electricity uh, between jurisdictions. Uh, which means that we don't yet have an integrated uh, energy market uh, in, in Canada for, you know, for, for all of the, you know, the decades that, uh, that we have developed it. So th I think that there's, there, well, I agree that there would be a very different perspective in Calgary. I think that on that point, uh, there would be, I think there would be some who would, who would be able to identify the same, the same challenge uh, of, an, of a development in the south that has not, not looked uh, northwards uh, as, as, and being imped impediment to... Uh, to future opportunities. Anything further? No? We'll take one last question at the top of the room and then we'll wind up. Okay. Um, during the questions, and this is just for everyone, during the questions and the discussion, there seems to be some anxiety over connecting the Western provinces to the Northern Territories. So my question is, why is this one region? Why isn't there a West and a North? And given the clear political divide between the North and the West, and the economic implications between being a territory and a province, especially for natural resources. This discussion at times seems to be about pushing forward the Western uh, political clout over the North rather than about the West itself. So why are these two different entities the same? Why is this all the West? Okay, briefly on this, anyone? Paul? Well, well the, the, <laughs> the territories see themselves as part of the West. And in fact, uh, you know, the Western Premier's uh, uh, annual meetings uh, actually are, are divided up between, uh, and not, not always equally, but, but, but sometimes uh, between, between issues that are of concern to the territories and issues uh, that are of concern to the provinces. Um, uh, the, you know, the, 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 we, could, we could talk a lot, and I, I don't think we have, uh, I think David's signaling, we're, <laughs> we're short on time. The, the fact that, that the territories were created as territories, uh, I think, is, is an accident of history, that if, if we had to, to redo it, uh, I think that there would be, uh, there would be lots of other uh, approaches based on, on geographic uh, you know, areas of interest. Um, but, but one point uh, that I was trying to stress is that the North actually begins uh, within the provinces, within the western provinces themselves. Uh, north of 60 is an entirely different region uh, than, than, uh, than, than the, the area that, uh, that we're currently in right now and that uh, the vast majority of western Canadians uh, live in. So, so that's, it's actually, you, you could argue about, you know, sort of maybe three different bands uh, if, if you wanted to make those distinctions. But nonetheless, many of the people who live in the far north actually do uh, orient themselves to, to the interests of, uh, or, or, or see a commonality with, with the interests of Western Canada. The thing is, though, I guess, and I don't know if this sheds light on your particular questions, the territories um, weren't created out of provinces. The provinces were created out of territories, um, out, out of particular, out of Rupert's Land and then the Northwest Territories. And they were given little tiny jurisdictions and limited tools of, of kind of self-government. And what really distinguishes the North in a political sense is they, they continue to lack some of those more um, 
weighty tools of self-government and control over natural resources. And so in that sense, there is an enduring political distinction, and it's one that, that has been an issue um, amongst um, both settlers and indigenous people in, in these places that have become the West for, for a long time. Um, and I'll also just sort of say that, that historically, the distinction between the South and the North only makes sense once we A, build a railroad, and B, build um, the Trans-Canada Highway, and that kind of creates that kind of orientation. A fur trade map of North America orients your eye north and, and west, and it connects it along waterways, and that distinction between the North and the South in a world dependent on ship, shipping, not on rail and not on air or freight, connects those places in all sorts of ways, and I think suggests some of the different kinds of possibilities of membership that we might have. Thank you. I'm going to ask Gary Glavin to provide a comprehensive summary. <laughs> but no pressure. Thank you, David, and thank you very much to the, the speakers tonight, and thank you, members of the audience, for coming out this evening. Um, Paul Volk reminds us that the West, to use the term the New West, is probably not appropriate because the West is, that term has been used uh, for a very long time, and the West is hardly new. And this thesis actually is advanced in, in a book by Gordon Pitts, who's a Globe and Mail uh, economic uh, writer, economic columnist. He wrote a book called Stampede, and it's in the title of tonight. It's called The Rise of the West, or he, he espouses the theory that it's not so much the New West, but the ascension of the West. Um, Ian Hudson reminds us that you don't always have to look backwards. You can look for a very s relatively small slice, a current slice of data to look at, uh, figure out what's going on in the West, but you can also look forward. And I, I, I have the very great privilege of being on the board of directors of the insurance company that insures Canadian blood services against bad things happening. And in that capacity, I get quarterly analyses of the Canadian economy, the outlook for the Canadian economy for the coming year. And HSBC, uh, Global Asset Management, is the ones that do it. And for the first time in seven years, they specifically alluded to, the, to Canadian markets, specifically provincial bond markets, and even more specifically, Western Canadian provincial bond markets as the place to grow and invest in, in 2013. So the West is indeed rising. And Adele Perry reminds us that it's always useful to look backwards so that history doesn't repeat itself. And I take you back to 1983, which was the height of the Trudeau government's uh, much uh, hated uh, national energy policy, which redirected Western Canadian energy resources to Eastern and Central Canada. And a very prominent Canadian was known to remark at that time, Canada is like an old cow. The West feeds it, Ontario and Quebec milk it, and you can only imagine what it's doing in the Maritimes. And that individual was no less prominent a Canadian than Tommy Douglas. Uh, so I think the West is, in fact, rising. Uh, it, whether it stays that way or not, I don't know. But tonight's discussion is certainly a great deal of food for thought. And thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. And I want to thank uh, all of the panelists. And I want to thank you for being here. Hope to see you again on uh, Wednesday, February the 6th here in this theater, where our topic will be Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Does the Rise of China Mean the Decline of the West? And as was the case tonight, we'll begin with a reception at 6.30, and the session itself will follow at 7. This is uh, the last night uh, that we will have uh, visionary conversations with uh, the presence of a person who has had a substantial contribution to them, to making this series happen. Uh, this is uh, one of the responsibilities that's handled in the um, uh, the portfolio of the Vice President External, John Kiersey, who is here. And both John and I would like to ask you to join us in thanking our colleague John Alho, who is going to stand up at the back so you can recognize him, uh, who has had a substantial hand in putting this together. John, thank you very much. And we're, we're thanking John because he's leaving the university and moving on to other things, but thanks for your contribution. Thank you all for being here, and come again next month. <laughs>